Welcome to Music History Week for the week of March 3rd through March 9th. So the birthdays this week will start with David Matthews. Not Dave Matthews, but David Matthews. Dave Matthews was a keyboardist who worked with James Brown, Bonnie Raitt, George Benson, Nina Simone, and more. He is 82. Bob Lewis, co-founder of Devo, is 77 this week. Yes bassist Chris Squire was born this week in 1948. Shaken Stevens is 76 this week. Chris Ray is 73 this week. Emilio Estefan of Miami Sound Machine is 71. Catherine O'Hara is 70 this week. Jason Newstead, formerly of Metallica, is 61 this week. Grand Poobah, not that one, but Grand Poobah is 58 this week. Evan Griffith Dando of the Lemonheads is 57 this week. Fergal Lawler, the Cranberries drummer, is 53 this week. And Ivy Queen is 52. Eddie Grant, whose single Electric Avenue went platinum and sat at number two in the Billboard Hot 100 for five weeks in 1983, is 76 this week. Dire Straits keyboardist Alan Clark is 72. Tina Marie, behind the groove singer, was born this week in 1956. Mark E. Smith, lead singer of The Fall, was born this week in 1957. The youngest BG, Andy Gibb, was born this week in 1958. Craig and Charlie Reed, twins of the Proclaimers, are 62. And John Frugasante, guitarist of Red Hot Chili Peppers, is 54. I hope I didn't mispronounce that. And in 1905, Bob Willis, King of Swing, was born. Wes Montgomery was born this week in 1923. And this week in, this week in 1944, Mary Wilson, founding member of the Supremes, was born. Here's a good one. David Gilmore is 78 this week. Kiki D is 77 this week. Phil Avin, leader of the Blasters, is 71 this week. Ah, Jarrett Reddick, front man for Bowling for Soup, is 52 this week. Guy Garvey, singer for Elbow, is 50. Chris Thompson, drummer from Vampire Weekend, is 40 this week. Chris White, bassist for the Zombies, is 81. Singer-songwriter Towns Van Zant was born this week in 1944. Arthur Lee, frontman for Love, was born this week in 1945. Peter Wolf, lead singer of the Jay Giles Band, is 78 this week. Ernie Isley of the Isley Brothers is 72. Taylor Dane is 62. Randy Meisner, bassist for the Eagles, was born this week in 1946. Clive Burr, drummer for Iron Maiden, was born this week in 1957. Gary Newman is 66. Peter Gill, drummer of Frankie Goes to Hollywood, is 60 this week. Sean Mullins is 56 this week. John Cale of the Velvet Underground is 81 this week. Vocal harem guitarist Robin Trower is 78 this week. The ben Folds Five bassist Robert Sledge is 55 this week. And Tone Loke is 57 this week. That is it for our birthdays. Now on to some of the important dates of the 1950s. In 1955, Elvis Presley made his TV debut when he appeared on the weekend show Louisiana Hayride on KWKH-TV, broadcast from Shreveport Auditorium in Shreveport, Louisiana. And in 1959, the winners of the first Grammy Awards were announced. 
Domenico Modugno's, hope I get that right, Valere was record of the year, Henry Mancini's Peter Gunn was album of the year, and the Champs Tequila won best R&B performance. Now on to the 1960s. No particular order. 1966, the Rolling Stones went into RCA's Hollywood Studios in Los Angeles to begin work on the album Aftermath. 1966, Neil Young, Stephen Stills, and Richie Fury formed Buffalo Springfield in Los Angeles. In 1967, in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, the Animals refused to play a slated concert unless they were paid up front. Consequently, <laughs> Consequently, more than 3,000 fans in the audience broke into a riot, causing about $5,000 worth of damages. In 1966, John Lennon made his infamous remarks that led to an uproar, and even led to the burning and banning of Beatle records for a brief period in some communities. In an interview with the Evening Standard, Lennon commented, quote, Christianity will go, it will vanish and shrink. We're more popular than Jesus now. I don't know which will go first. Rock and roll or Christianity? Jesus was all right, but his disciples were thick and ordinary. Lennon later apologized. And in 1967, the Rolling Stones went to number one on the U.S. singles chart with Ruby Tuesday, the group's fourth number one single. According to a 1971 Rolling Stone interview, Keith Richards said he wrote the song in a Los Angeles hotel room in early 1966 about a groupie he knew. Marianne Faithful, however, recalls it differently. According to her, Brian Jones presented an early version of this melody to the rest of the Rolling Stones, and many believe that Jones actually wrote the song. 1963, the Beatles recorded what would be their third single, From Me to You, just five days after John Lennon and Paul McCartney wrote the song. Talk about efficient. In 1965, the Yardbirds released For Your Love. In 1965, history was made when the Smokey Robinson written My Girl made The Temptations the first male Motown act to score a number one single. 1963, Please Please Me by The Beatles shows up at number 40 on the Chicago radio station WLS weekly silver dollar survey, marking the first time a Beatles song makes a radio station survey in America. WLS very likely became the first U.S. radio station to play a Beatles song when they put Please Please Me on the air. 1965, Bob Dylan's single Subterranean Homesick Blues was released in the United States. 1965, David Bowie made his TV debut with the Manish Boys on a UK program called Gadzooks, It's All Happening. When they performed their signal, I Pity the Fool, the song was originally recorded by Bobby Bland in 1961 for Duke Records, in the Manish Boys version, Jimmy Page plays the guitar solo. Bowie later used this guitar riff for two different songs, first on The Superman from 1971 and second on Dead Man Walking from 1977. In 1966, Bob Dylan recorded Just Like a Woman for his Blonde on Blonde album at Columbia Recording Studios in Nashville, Tennessee. 1969, the small faces split up after singer Steve Marriott announced he was leaving the band. Ronnie Lane, Ian McLagan, and Kenny Jones linked up with Ronnie Wood and Rod Stewart and formed The Faces. 1969, Happy Birthday becomes the first song to be performed in outer space when the astronauts on Apollo 9 sing it to celebrate the birthday of the director of NASA space operations, Christopher Kraft. In 1964, the Beatles filmed the last day of the train scenes for the movie A Hard Day's Night. During their six days of filming aboard a moving train, the Beatles traveled a total of 2,500 miles on the rails. And in 1966, the Beach Boys started recording God Only Knows. Let's move to the 1970s. In 1972, Harry Nilsson snagged a gold record for Nilsson Schmilson the best-selling album of his career. It featured Without You, Jump Into the Fire, and Coconut. 1973, the Grammy Awards were held at the Tennessee Theater in Nashville. The album of the year went to George Harrison's The Concert for Bangladesh, and the band America were named the best new artist. In 1971, the Rolling Stones announced they were moving to France, mostly for tax purposes. 
1973 at the Dane County Memorial Coliseum in Madison, Wisconsin, Pink Floyd played the first night of a 19-date North American tour. In 1977, CBS Records released The Clash's self-titled debut album in the UK. CBS in the US refused to release it until 1979. Until that time, Americans bought more than 100,000 imported copies of the record, making it one of the biggest selling imports of all time. 1977, Barbara Streisand, a three-week run at number one on the U.S. singles chart with Love Theme from A Star Is Born, her second U.S. number one. And in 1975, Led Zeppelin's physical graffiti album is certified gold. In 1970, Creedence Clearwater Revival peaked at number two on the Billboard Hot 100 singles chart with Traveling Band, which was their fifth top ten single in the U.S. And in 1970, Simon and Garfunkel's Bridge Over Troubled Waters started a 10-week run at number one on the U.S. chart. The duo had split up by the time of the release. The album includes two of Simon and Garfunkel's most critically acclaimed and commercially successful songs, Bridge Over Trouble Water and The Boxer. And in 1973, a song from the movie Deliverance called Dueling Banjos by Eric Weisberg and Steve Mandel became one of the few 1970s instrumentals to be awarded a gold record. In 1975, David Bowie released his ninth studio album, Young Americans, which contained his first number one hit in the U.S., Fame. A side note, John Lennon helped write that song, Fame. In 1976, Elton John was immortalized at Madame Trussant's Wax Museum in London. John was the first rock star to receive this honor since the Beatles. I didn't know that. In 1970, Diana Ross made her first performance as a solo act when she appeared in Framingham, Massachusetts. Her self-titled solo debut included her signature songs Reach Out and Touch Somebody's Hand and Ain't No Mountain High Enough, the latter becoming Ross's first number one solo single. 1973, Paul McCartney was fined $170 for growing cannabis at his farm in Campbelltown, Scotland. McCartney claimed some fans gave him the seeds. <laughs> 1973, Paul McCartney was fined $170 for growing cannabis at his farm in Campbelltown, Scotland. McCartney claimed some fans gave the seeds to him and that he didn't know what they would grow. All right, Paul. 1974, Queen 2, fittingly as it was their second album, was released in the UK, following a month later with a US release. None of the tracks chart in America, but Seven Seas of Rye lands at number 10 in the UK. 1974, John Denver records any song and thank God I'm a country boy at RCA's Music Center of the World Studios in Los Angeles. In 1977, Foreigner releases their self-debut title album, Foreigner. Why aren't you not in the Rock Hall yet? In 1970, having recently changed their name from Earth to Black Sabbath, Ozzy Osbourne, Tony Iommi, Geezer Butler, and Bill Ward made their concert debut at the Roundhouse in London. Now we move to the 1980s. In 1986, Metallica released their third album, Master of Puppets, featuring an anthemic title track that becomes their most played live song. In 1983, Michael Jackson started a seven week run at number one on the US singles chart with Billie Jean. In 1982, the Go-Go's started a six-week run at number one on the U.S. album chart with Beauty and the Beast, containing the hits Our Lips Are Sealed and We Got the Beat. The album sold in excess of three million copies and reached triple platinum status, making it one of the most successful debut albums of all time. It is widely considered one of the cornerstone albums of the 1980s new wave music. It was the first album entirely written and performed by an all-female band at the top of the charts. In 1987, Beastie Boys became the first rap act to have a number one album in the United States with their debut album, License to Ill. In 2003, the album was ranked number 217 on Rolling Stones magazine's list of 500 greatest albums of all times. 1983, Tears for Fear's first album, The Hurting, is released. In 1985, I remember this well. The song, We Are the World, is released as a single, soon achieving massive chart successes all around the world. The song, written by Lionel Richie and Michael Jackson, is recorded for charity to help battle famine in Africa. 
The supergroup USA for Africa brought together for the recording features a stunning list of big names in music. Everyone from Bruce Springsteen and Bob Dylan to Ray Charles, Cyndi Lauper and Dionne Warwick. In 1987, Peter Gabriel reached the top 10 of the Billboard Hot 100 singles chart for the second and final time with Big Time, which peaked at number 8. The song featured Stuart Copeland from The Police on Drums. In 1986, Whitney Houston went on to number one in the U.S. album chart with her self-titled debut album. It spent a total of 14 weeks at the number one position. In 1981, Robert Plant played a secret gig at Keele University, England with his new band, The Honey Drippers. In 1985, REO Speedwagon started a three-week run at number one on the U.S. singles chart with Can't Fight This Feeling. In 1987, U2 released Joshua Tree. It would go on to win a Grammy for Album of the Year and go Diamond. Sales of 10 million copies. Diamond. And that brings us to the 1990s. In 1995, the Foo Fighters made their live debut during a benefit show in Portland, Oregon. In 1992, R.E.M. cleaned up in the Rolling Stone Music Awards, winning Album of the Year for Out of Time, Artist of the Year, Best Single and Best Video for Losing My Religion, and for the Best Band, Best Guitarist and Best Songwriter Awards. Wow, I don't even remember the Rolling Stone Music Awards, if I'm being honest. Well, this one's a visual for you. In 1994, Grace Slick was arrested for pointing a shotgun at police at her Tiberian, California home. Cooler heads prevailed, however. The following June, she was sentenced to 200 hours of community service and mandatory attendance at a long series of Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. 1998, o Oasis singer Liam Gallagher... <laughs> In 1998, Oasis singer Liam Gallagher appeared handcuffed in a Brisbane court on charges of headbutting a fan during a gig in Australia. Gallagher was released on bail. And in 1991, readers of Rolling Stone voted George Michael as the sexiest male artist. And in 1990, I do remember this, Cher won the worst dressed female and worst video if... <laughs> Cher won the worst dressed female and worst video for If I Could Turn Back Time in the Rolling Stone Magazine Awards. Donny Osmond won the Most Unwelcome Comeback Award. My gosh, what are these awards? Oh, wow, that's horrible. All right. 1993, Beavis and Butthead, a show about two animated idiots who watch MTV, debuts on MTV. In 1994, Two influential albums from the 1990s were released, Soundgarden's Super Unknown and Nine Inch Nails' The Downward Spile. They entered the album chart at number one and number two respectively. Super Unknown is Soundgarden's fourth studio release. It spawned five singles, including Black Hole Sun and Spoon Man. Nine Inch Nails' The Downward Spile includes their most controversial single, Closer, and Grammy-nominated single, Her. In 1990, legendary singer-songwriter Carole King was inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame in New York City. King is one of the most prolific songwriters of our lifetime, having written or co-written 118 pop hits on the Billboard Hot 100 between 1955 and 1999. Holy crap. She has made 25 solo albums, the most successful being Tapestry, which held the record for most weeks at number one by a female artist for more than 20 years. She has won four Grammy Awards, the Library of Congress Gershwin Prize for Popular Song, the first woman to be so honored, and is a Kennedy Center honoree. 1991, Should I Stay or Should I Go gave The Clash their only UK number one single. Nothing like a delayed award there. Just love the Gallagher brothers. In 1996, Oasis guitarist Noel Gallagher walked off stage during a gig at the Vernon Valley Gorge Ski Resort in New Jersey because his hands were too cold to play. Come on. Come on, Noel. You didn't see John Lennon wanting to quit on the rooftop concert, did you? Now on to the 2000s. And in 2009, 
to celebrate the release of U2's 12th studio album and their appearance every night for a week on The Late Show with David Letterman, New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg temporarily renamed part of 53rd Street in Midtown Manhattan to U2A. <clears throat> in 2009, Britney Spears kicked off a world tour in New Orleans, her first concert tour in five years. 27-year-old dressed as a ringmaster in the show and featured jugglers, acrobats, and martial arts. What? And martial arts dancers? Don't know what a martial arts dancer is, but okay. 2015, Daryl Hall and John Oates sued cereal maker Early Bird Foods and Company over the company's use of the name Hall and Oates for their maple syrup granola bars. The two musicians accused a Brooklyn-based firm of infringing on their trademark by creating a phonetic play on the band's well-known name. Wouldn't be their first time going to court, now would it? In 2002, the first episode of The Osbournes aired on TV. On MTV. In 2000, Eric Clapton was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, making him the first person inducted three times. He was also inducted as a member of the Yardbirds and Cream. In 2006, Pearl Jam made their new single, Worldwide Suicide, available as a free download after making a 15-second clip available on the internet. The song topped the Billboard Alternative Songs chart, where it spent a total of three weeks at number one. Jonathan Cohen of Billboard said in his review of the song that, quote, atop a propulsive beat in a thick three-guitar attack, better person personalizes his anger that the U.S. occupation of Iraq has reached a three-year mark. He added, Rock Radio should jump on this despite the delicate subject matter. And in 2009, thousands of Fish fans descended upon Hampton, Virginia to see Paige McConnell, John Fishman, Trey Anastasio, and Mike Gordon return to the stage for their first show since 2004. They opened with Fluffhead, a song they haven't played since 2000. I said this one at least 20 times and I can't spit it out. So, in 2004, the Smiths song, quote, I know it's over, top the pole of tunes which people turn to when they are miserable. In, quote, the songs that saved your life poll by BBC radio station Six Music. REM's Everybody Hurts and Radiohead's Fake Plastic Trees also made the top 10. In 2003, 50 Cent's first signal, In The Club, tops the Hot 100 for the first of nine weeks. In 2012, 76-year-old Jerry Lee Lewis married for the seventh time when he wed his caregiver, Judith Brown. Lewis split from his sixth wife, Carrie McCarver, in 2004 after 20 years of marriage. Brown, who was 14 years younger than Lewis, was previously married to the star's cousin, Rusty. Why am I not surprised? And lastly, for the 2000s, save this one for last. In 2004, Tom Jones was banned from wearing tight leather pants by his son and manager, Mark Jones. Mark told Tom it was time to, quote, dress his age as he was in danger of becoming a laughing stock at 63. And that is dates that were important for this week in the news. <laughs> I can't even talk. And that's it for important dates in this week in music history. Now on to those we lost this week in music history. We'll start with this. In 1973, Grateful Dead keyboard player Ron Pigpen McKernan, a founding member of the band, dies at the age of 27. Rest in peace, Pigpen. In 1982, actor, comedian, and blues brother John Belushi died of an overdose in Los Angeles. He was only 33. In 1997, notorious B.I.G. was killed as he left a party at the Peterson Automotive Museum in Los Angeles. Born Christopher Wallace, the rapper was pronounced dead on arrival at Cedar sinai Hospital. He was 24 years old. In 2017, guitarist Jim Fuller from the Safaris died at age 69. The Safaris had the 1963 U.S. number two and U.K. number three single, Wipeout, and Fuller was known as the godfather of surf music, a Californian instrumental music. With his Fender guitar, he contributed to the popularity of Fender instruments. And in 2020, 
Barbara Martin died at the age of 76. She is best known as one of the original members of the Motown group, The Supremes. She and her groupmates, Diana Ross, Mary Wilson, and Florence Ballard signed a recording contract with Motown founder Barry Gordy on January 15, 1961 as The Supremes. In 2001, Michael Smitty Smiths, a drummer for Paul Revere and the Raiders, died in Hawaii at age of 58. In 2013, English guitarist, singer Alvin Lee died at the age of 68. Lee's performance at the Woodstock Festival in 1969 was captured on film in the documentary of the event, and his lightning fast playing helped catapult him to stardom. In 2011, Allison Chain's bass player Mark Starr dies of a prescription drug overdose at the age of 44. Starr was the last person to see the group's lead singer, Lane Staley, before he died in 2002. 2020. American record producer Keith Olsen died at the age of 74. He worked with many artists including Rick Springfield, Fleetwood Mac, Ozzy Osbourne, The Grateful Dead, White Snake, Pat Benatar, Hart, Santana, Foreigner, Scorpions, Magnum, Journey, Emerson Lake and Palmer, Joel Walsh, and Eric Burden and the Animals. Wow, what a busy guy. And lastly, 2016, English record producer, arranger, composer, conductor, audio engineer, and musician, Sir George Martin died at the age of 90. He worked as EMI Records' in-house record producer and became known as the fifth Beatle. Martin produced all but one of the Beatles albums, giving him 30 number one hit signals in the UK and 23 number one hits in the US. He also produced many other acts, including Matt Monroe, Celia Black, Jerry and the Pacemakers, Billy J. Kramer and the Dakotas, The Foremost, Jeff Beck, Ultravox, Kenny Rogers, UFO, Cheap Trick, Elton John, and Celine Dion. Martin received a knighthood in 1996. And that is it for the week in music history from March 3rd through March 9th. Hope you enjoyed it. Have a great rest of your week and hope to see you on a video soon. Take care. Bye.